What's up, everybody? One last show before 2023, which gives us time to celebrate all that was 2022. Welcome in. This is Celtics Beat. I am Adam Kaufman. No Evan Valenti today. As you know, he did the show without me last week. I was taking some time around the holidays, and then he had COVID, but I think overall he's good. But at the moment, he's just taking a little vacation time for himself as well. So don't worry. Don't worry about Evan. You will see him again when we start off 2023. Most importantly, though, way more important than either of the two of us, it's today's guest, Gary Washburn. You know him from the Boston Globe. He's a good friend of this podcast. And of course, you know him from the A-List podcast as well, which he is on part of the CLNS Media Network each and every week. Gary, happy holidays. And how are you? Good, Adam. How's it going? Everything's good. Everything's good. Uh everything's great everything's great with the celtics i know there was the the little blip there to begin that homestand obviously three losses and a couple to orlando and everybody's starting to wonder what the hell was going on but obviously they finished strong the four wins to cap a four and three homestand heading on the road four game trip begins in denver on new year's day which is sunday just a few days from now but uh it, it was good to before we get into some of the the bigger picture stuff and player specific team all of that it was just good to see them right the ship and not kind of you know live into the end of the calendar year yeah i mean i think that they struggle with teams with size orlando had size and also the celtics just hit and didn't hit any shots in those two games i mean they probably should have won the second game i think the first game was kind of orlando was the better team i think the second game was just one of those anomalies you know um banchero hitting six threes season high i think admiral schofield entered the game with 13 threes for the season he hits three in nine minutes one of those things where it just was their night they got a lot of the breaks and then those offensive rebounds so that's a game they could have probably scratched out but uh they lost and then the indiana game that first half was just miserable um just could give it up 71 points trailing by tra trailing by 28 um and then something happened, obviously, at that halftime. They played great ball since, um, kind of making a rally against Indiana, although I'm not going to give them big credit for rallying against the Pacers. I mean, they should have been in that position in the first place, but taking care of Minnesota, and Minnesota's a tricky team to play. I mean, they got a lot of skilled players. They don't always play so well. Uh, if you can look at Minnesota, they're 16 and 19 now. They're just, they lose so many close games. And then taking care of Milwaukee, and then uh, Houston, which was I thought was a tricky kind of a trap game. Houston had just won the night before at Chicago. A lot of good young players, and the Celtics were able to pull away and do what you're supposed to do against a young team like that. And then also the Clipper game. I thought that was probably their best victory of the season. Not, you know, the Clippers are a team that was, they were fully healthy. Um, you know, the, they came back uh, and took the lead at the end of the fourth, third quarter, the Clippers did. And so the Celtics had to take that game. It was up for grabs and they took it. And that's with Jason Tatum scoring one point in the fourth quarter and missing all five of his shots, you know? So I thought that was probably the more impressive victory. Obviously people would point to the Phoenix game and be like, that's probably the best they've looked. You know, there's the best they've looked. And then there's the most impressive win of the season. I thought the Clipper game was more impressive considering uh, the fact that the Clippers were, I said, at full strength, know how to win on the road, a bunch of veteran guys, and the Celtics were, did not have, let's say, a game Tatum, and they were still able to win. I had said a couple weeks ago on the show, just right before that homestand started, seven game homestand, you know, we, we kind of, the, the way we framed it, Evan and I was like, what's an acceptable record for this homestand? And it, my feeling anyway, going in was, Based on how well they played, where they were health-wise, the opponents, obviously, and I know Orlando came in playing well and, and did play well, but overall, like, Magic aren't a great team. So I, I looked at it and I said, five and two. Five and two is what you want to do on this homestand. Like, if you go six and one, great, but five and two is acceptable. And obviously, the slow start, like I said, they finished four and three. Does Because of the way they finished, does that kind of make it okay? Or do you still look at it and say the homestand wasn't what it should have been? He has a, a disappointment because uh, I just think five and two, like if you get one of those Orlando games, it makes it a little bit better or that Indiana game, but they should have started out if you conceivably three and oh or four and oh before they went into the Milwaukee game. 
So they 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 flourish at the hard part. They beat Milwaukee. They beat the Clippers. Uh, they were able to overcome Minnesota, but then they lose to two games to the Magic, and the Magic are playing good ball. Like they've continued to play good basketball, um, but obviously they're they're an up and down team. They lost it by twenty to Detroit the other night. Uh, so this is not this was a, this was those are two games I think that you know we can t- d- discuss the whole you know Tatum personal reasons thing missing on Sunday. You know, I thought that was, and I and I get it. You know, he and if, if the rumors are right, I haven't gotten it confirmed that it was a, it was a, you know, Deuce's birthday and that type of thing. And I, you know, we can discuss that if you want. But that was kind of an important game to miss, considering yeah. that they had lost the previous one, and that Orlando wasn't going to back down. And so uh, I think it four and three is a disappointment. But considering they won the last four and they're going on a streak. And then now they still got the best record in the NBA. And now, I mean, uh, you know, we can talk about this too. Adam, like, you know, now Brooklyn's the number two seed. Brooklyn yeah. just overtook Milwaukee uh, with Milwaukee losing to the Bulls. And so Brooklyn is now number two and now Milwaukee's number three. And so I think um, kind of mission accomplished. You, you stayed healthy. You got Robert back. You're still number one in the East. Would you like a five or six game lead on that? Of course you would. I mean, you know, but I think they're in a good, they feel like they're in a good position. They, they, they lost the number one seed for a minute. They got it back. Um, now they're a couple of games up. Um, so, you know, it didn't, it wasn't as horrible as, as it appeared it was going to be, especially after that Indiana loss. Now, obviously Gary, I mean, it's, it, it just sounds nice. It doesn't matter as much because ultimately the conference is, is the most important thing when it comes to playoff seating and all that. But it's not just number one in the East. It's number one in the entire NBA. Celtics are 26 and 10 right now. Like you said, narrowly in front of both the Nets and the Bucks. And uh, if we kind of it's it's not halfway mark of the season, but if you kind of look at it as, as the break in the calendar years, looking back, as I'm sure, you know, and it's been tweeted all over the place, you might have tweeted it as well. The the, the regular season games for the last calendar year, 2022, uh, what was it, 60, 60 and 22, which is the best winning percentage for uh Boston a regular season since the 2008 title year so uh you know in good company clearly and as you just noted there are some really good teams that are both near the top of the conference there are a couple of good teams in the western conference as well it's not like this is a a layup to a championship that doesn't exist you can't uh, forecast those things even going right into the postseason let alone sitting here at, at the end of December but is this the team if if we're to Harken back to 2008. Is this the group now that you think is is really poised for Banner 18? I think this is their best chance. I mean, you could say last year was their best chance, uh, considering um, they were right there. Yeah, they were right there. <laughs> but I think this is might be their best team since then. The 2010 team was good, but they were obviously they. <laughs> They were a little flawed. They were a little old, long in the tooth. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't know what happens if Perk doesn't tear his ACL and all that. You can go back there 12 years, 13 years. But I think this is their best chance. I think the league, Adam, is vulnerable. Like, there's no great team in the West. It's If you want to say Memphis, you can. If you want to say New Orleans, you can. Phoenix just lost by 20-some points at Washington. They're taking it on the chin. They're not, they haven't been right since they went to the finals. Uh, Dallas is just kind of Luka. And I mean, so the West and, and, the, and the Clippers are a team, I think, that everything has to go right in terms of their health. Uh, but they, they could, you know, but I, I think that they're the best team, some of the best team in the league at this point. Um, they've beaten Milwaukee. They've beaten Brooklyn, Cleveland. They've had trouble uh, against, lost twice. Uh, we'll see what happens when they meet again. But I think at this point, uh, this is their best chance. If it's going to be any year, it's going to be this year uh, to me. That's just how I look at it. It's not, you know, uh, just a matter of life and death. I mean, they'll still be a good ball club next year. They'll have everybody back next year. Everyone's under contract for next year. So it's not like they're losing, you know, five free agents or something like that. Or they're just, it's going to be the, the 90, you know, the, the 97 Marlins. But I do think, though, uh, considering the rest of the league, considering 
teams like the Lakers have been disappointments. The Warriors are struggling in the East. The Knicks just lost one. Like, there's no great teams, you know, in the in the league right now. I mean, Milwaukee could be when they get Middleton back, and but Milwaukee's had some really curious losses. Uh, so I think this is the year for them, the Celtics. I, I think take care of business in the regular season, make sure Robert Williams is healthy and all that. Get all your business done in the regular season, gain the number one seed, and then just go all out and try to get that banner 18. Head coach Ime Odoka, that is his title still, uh, albeit suspended, 51 and 31 last year, as people may remember. People are having fun with this on, on social media. Uh, 622 winning percentage. And then you have interim head coach Joe Mazzula, 24 and 10 before this uh, eye abrasion that I guess he suffered playing pickup hoops, and, and he has been out the last couple of games. So that's a 706 winning percentage. And then you have interim interim coach Damon Stoudemire coming in, 2 and 0 so far, which only leads me to believe. Gary that as soon as the video guy gets a crack at this you know the the other team may not score a bucket but <laughs> you know the 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 serious question though and I don't want to like discount I love Joe I, and and Joe we'll get to this a little bit but like it's only a matter of time before the interim tag comes off he officially is the head coach and and he has this job for years to come like he's the guy but I, I guess it, it it sort of makes me think a little bit to I, I use this example occasionally when I don't remember what year it was, but when, you know, Steve Kerr was out all those games like half the season and and it was uh, uh, Luke Walton filled in for him and, and yeah. he went like 44 and two or some absurd record, whatever it was. And then obviously Walton goes on to other stops and doesn't have nearly the same success because the teams weren't even close to being as good. When you have just an elite team, a truly superior team, which obviously these Celtics are, is coaching, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but is it just not nearly as important when you get to a certain level as it is when you're a team that's either rebuilding or, you know, mediocre and still rising? Yeah, I do think coaching might not be as as critical at this point because this team has been together so many years and they know each other. They know Joe. Now they know Damon. Uh, but I do think it's important. Some of the tactical situations, the ways to improve the defense, ways to get guys open shots, uh, things that tactical stuff, you know, strategy stuff, maybe not managing the game or, you know, uh, maybe, you know, Tatum knows where he needs to be. Brown knows where he needs to be, but maybe devising new plays to get them better shots maybe setting up Robert Williams to get that, you know, that alley-oop dunk, maybe the little tactical things still think is very important. And I think that Joe has his own particular style, obviously, as we've seen, that's different from Ime. And he sticks to it. And I also think he's learning a lot on the run, on the fly. Uh, but I do think coaching is important. Is it important as it is in Oklahoma City or Orlando, where you're really trying to just develop guys and you're literally just trying to get them to get better, be, become pros and get them to take a, a step toward, you know, the semblance of playoff contention in future years. Yeah, yeah you, you're, you're coaching veteran guys. You're coaching Marcus. You're coaching Jason, Jalen. You know, I mean, Marcus is in his ninth year. <laughs> Jalen's in his seventh and Jalen's in his sixth. I mean, it just seems like it happened yesterday. They're all drafted. <laughs> but these are guys. These are, these are veterans. Brogdon, veteran. Horford, veteran. You know, even Robert Williams is becoming a veteran, you know, as much as, as we always see him as a young, young, real, real young guy. Um, but that's a veteran ball club, and they know what to do, and they know where to be. And I think they've kind of partnered with Joe in terms of his coaching. And I think having a good staff with Damon and Ben Sullivan, Tony Dobbins, and a lot of those guys who, who have helped. But I do think coaching is important. I just think at this stage, at, it's a different level that Missoula is doing a different job than let's say Jamal Mosley in Orlando or, you know, Mike Brown in Sacramento guys that are trying to get the carry their team to the postseason or coaching a bunch of guys and trying to get them to be pros. These guys are pros, you know, and they learned, I think a lot, Adam, under Udoka. I think that the, 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 the roughness, the, 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 the you know, the tough transition has already happened. So I think they were ready to flourish this year, regardless of who the coach was. And I think that they're flourishing under Joe because they have a lot of respect for him, but also they know and they've been there. 
So this doesn't, it, it doesn't really make a difference, Gary, because like I said, like Joe's the guy and Joe's going to be the guy going forward. But you've obviously written, among others, uh, about the the interim situation for Missoula. You've questioned in columns, like when is the team going to take away the interim tag and just give him the head coach label? And of course, very recently, just in the last, whatever, few days, talked to Brad Stevens about it. And, and Brad essentially said like, yeah, we're good with how things are going right now. It's It's not about labels. It's about you know, how we're doing and we're doing well. So, you know, it, this, that's, that's a conversation for later. My feeling, and I've said this on the show, going back to when, when all of this happened, which obviously was right before the start of the regular season, my feeling has been that Joe was not going to lose the interim tag until Emei is fully out of the picture, which almost happened, obviously, in, in terms of the Brooklyn situation, then it fell through and it didn't. So all of a sudden he's, he's back in the shadows again, I guess you might say, but I guess I just wonder, and I don't, I don't know if legally it should make a difference or or if there's just a, a fundamental difference or if there's no difference at all, you tell me. But I I, I think that, you know, we're not going to see Joe become head coach, you know, no interim tag until the EMA buyout is done and he is, he is gone and just no longer here. Yeah, I, I do think that there's some legal ramifications that have to go down over the last you know, next few months. And um and I think Joe's proven capable of being an NBA head coach. Okay. We you know I don't think it's that we're, 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 we're what 36 games in mm-hmm. 44, I think it's 44% of the season. So he has shown he's ready, but I do think that they don't want, because they've been, if you name uh, Missoula full-time head coach, you've got to make a decision on email. Like either you a fire him or, or release him from his contract B give him another position within the organization, whatever, or, 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 or see come to some type of contract settlement where, you know, whatever. Like, so I, I think that they're kind of putting that on hold for now. Um, and, and maybe it could be a situation where they're waiting to see if another team comes and gets them so they don't have to pay them. Uh, I think there's a lot of legal stuff behind the scenes, Adam, that, is keeping the Celtics. And I don't think they also want to just put that pressure on Joe. Like, I just think they kind of, I think they've probably certainly promised Joe, listen, you know, this is your job. We're we're not going to have you coach here a full season, you know, and then put you right back to the assistance box. While, you know, this is one of those things with Krzyzewski having back surgery at Duke or, 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 or like the Kerr situation, you know, where, He's guaranteed it's not, you know, he's not coming back. So I, I'm sure Joe knows that. And I'm sure the organization is fine. It made some agreements. And I just think for us, of course, as the media, we want to know what's going on. Why isn't he the, uh, the coach yet? Why don't you just make the call? Um, and I think the Celtics is just being very meticulous with this whole situation. I think that that's how they've handled this the whole time. Afraid to make a mistake. And that's understandable, you know. And 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 who knows what the situation with you you doke is? Are they talking on a on occasion? Are they checking in? Is he checking in with them? Are they checking in with him? Have they arranged for him to get some type of a therapy session or get some type of? Remember, he's still an employee of the Celtics organization. Have they given him a referral to a therapist? Have they dealt with him? Have, they, have has he talked to anybody? Uh, just a, like we don't know, you know, they they they've kind of stopped mentioning his name and. You know, it, it gets some people, the organization kind of cringe when they hear his name. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of ends to be tied, loose ends to be tied up before they name Missoula the coach. But I do think Missoula will be the coach. That's for certain. For, for certain. Yeah, I know. I totally agree with you. And uh, obviously, we keep talking about aspects of the coaching and uh, Joe's going to have to, I guess, chill out on the pickup for a little while or at least wear goggles or something when he's out there so that, you know, he doesn't run into another one of these setbacks and he can't play. We, we want to yeah. or want, you know, can't coach, want to see him on the sidelines yeah. there, as Jason Tatum said, you know, chewing the crap out of some gum. But uh, it, let's talk about the players, whether it's Tatum, whether it's Brown, both these guys, you know, playing at absurd levels at, at you know Tatum in, in his case an MVP level he's in that conversation we'll talk about that in a little bit in some of the odds but Jalen Brown uh you know is is often this team's leading scorer on a given night his numbers are very comparable with those of Tatum's only a few points off he's still averaging 27 plus points he's you know it it, it was once upon a time he was a guy that 
you know, for, for us, not for him. He always, uh, I'm sure dreamed to the moon, but for us, it was like, all right, can we see Jason Tatum or, or Jalen Brown rather at a, at, at a perennial all-star level, or is he always going to be kind of this fringe all-star guy? Some years he makes it, some years he doesn't right now though. It's not all-star. We're talking all NBA. Are both of these guys, Gary, right now, as we approach the midpoint of the season, all NBA players? Yeah, I don't know if they're all NBA. I mean, Jason, I think it's first team. Yeah. Jalen could be second team or third team. Yeah. I think both of them are playing like top. I mean, basically, these are top 15 players. Right. You know, and you throw in some three, but you got to, you know, assign some people some positions. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think Jalen's one of the top three to four forwards in the league at this point. And Jason's could be number one or number two. Now, if you want to you know, say, if you want to consider Giannis a forward or, or center or however, you know, I mean, and is Kevin Durant a guard and all, you know, we can, mm-hmm. we can go through all that stuff. But um, yeah, I think both of them are top 15 players, especially Jalen has reached that top 15 status. I think he was top, you know, maybe 30 to 40 last year. And it's kind of crept up over the, over the years. But I think this year he's playing top 15 ball, you know, 27 points a game, you know, uh, just making big shots, taking over games, you know, that fourth quarter, he had 23 points in the fourth quarter. He had 11, I want to say in the Clippers game, 11 in the fourth quarter or 12 in the fourth quarter uh, to kind of help seal that win, even though the defense won it, you know, Jalen was a leading scorer. Tatum said at one point in the fourth quarter. So Jalen is getting that ability to, that, to take over games and, and to just have that stretch of, 14 points out of 18 points, things like that, and, and carry the Celtics at times. And I think that takes a great deal of pressure off Tatum, and that makes the Celtics a more dangerous team. So, yeah, I think both uh, will make all NBA if we were to decide right now. Is uh, I guess the, the thing that I really am enjoying, as much as I'm enjoying, obviously, what they're doing on the floor, the thing that is is – most resonating with me throughout the the start of this season first half of the season is just i'm really enjoying listening to the both of them tatum in particular you know in in talking with all of you guys doing you know post-game media conferences or hopping on the random podcast which you know tatum has done from time to time and just you know how much more polished in in many ways that they are and in communicating the way they want to and obviously the way they've grown and matured into leaders they're just so for lack of a better way of putting it, Gary, they're, they're very clearly, and, and, and I think this was kind of always the case for Brown, but more so of late for Tatum in the last couple of years, just so comfortable in their own skin. You know, I, I, and, and Tatum in particular, listening to him recently and in terms of the way, you know, he's, he's kept some of the receipts was asked uh, the other night about, you know, just where he and, and Brown are as, as a duo and their growth and their comfort playing together and, and their ascension and all of that. And uh, there was Bobby Manning, our, our pal that asked the question and brought up Michael Jordan and Scotty Pippen and, and Tatum sort of, you know, clap back with the, you know, a year ago, you guys wanted to trade one of us. And now we're being asked about Michael and Scotty and, you know, we're not there yet, but that's where we aspire to be obviously. But the, the most important thing is winning. He always brings it back to winning and Jalen does the same thing. Individual accolades are great, but team success is paramount. And so uh, you know, I'm kind of rambling here, but I'm just I'm I'm enjoying listening to these guys because I just think they're in such a great headspace that in many ways I think was helped by losing in the finals last year. Yeah. Um, I think don't get me wrong, you'll still take the final you'll you'll take the championship over losing. But, yeah, I, but no, I think I agree with you I, sorry, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. I agree with I think that um I think Tatum is just matured all the way, and it's not a knock against him. Not not say he came to the league immature. That's not what I'm saying. No, I'm saying nineteen. Yeah, he's become more, like you said, confident and just open with us as media. He knows we have a job to do. Mm-hmm. Um, there is no issues. There is no anger. There is no resentment. There is no with Tatum. There's a be- definite level of comfort. Um, I think he enjoys talking to the media. Um, I think he has gained a voice and an opinion. I think that, you know, he was a man of few words when he came to the league. He was very robotic. Um, he was very stiff. You know, now he is, he, he jokes, he laughs. Uh, you know, he, he has, you know, he, he bakes, he says what he feels. Uh, he obviously, obviously, you know, 
drops a curse word here and there, just kind of just to let, let people know if he's a little upset. The same with Jalen. I think both of them have matured into different and uh, polished men at this point that are now comfortable in their place in the league, in the Celtics, and so they're they're fine, and that's a good place. And I think when people have asked me, well, you know, what's happened? Why are they playing? Why are they playing so well? And I think one the key component in any kind of relationship is that they get along, and I think that that's the biggest thing that I said a few years ago, even. When, before all this trade Jalen and trade Jason, yeah. um, the biggest thing I saw was that they got along, okay? That they weren't competing with each other. And they were competing with each other like, like you know, uh, playing one-on-one after practice, that type of thing, but not resentful of each other's success. Mm-hmm. And that's huge when you have teammates who are around the same age. I think Jalen's like a year and a half and you know, we've seen these, you know, dynamic, quote unquote, quote unquote, dynamic duos, guys that were supposed to be, you know, a, um, you know, take the league by storm, botch it because they couldn't get along. You know, or one of them wanted out. Or yeah. One of them wanted to be one. A, both guys wanted to be a one. And you know, no, like we've seen Jack that. And Penny. Huh? Yeah. Jack and Penny. Or, you know, Garnett and Marbury. Like, sure. yeah. we've seen that happen. And in this situation, it's not because they know they can coexist. They're not competing for, you know, Jalen is not after a bunch of endorsements. Jason is an endorsement guy. Jalen is doing his social activism and, and making his statements in his way. Jason does it in his way. They respect each other. Jason's a, a obviously as a father of a five year old son. Jalen doesn't like they're different, and I but I think they respect each other's differences, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a that's a great thing for the South organization. Like that's the best thing you could have hoped for was they get along, because you don't want guys being jealous of each other, backbiting each other, you know, whatever. Um, and I think that they both have been. In, uh, are now comfortable in their own skin, their own place in the league. And I think that, that you're right, Adam. I think that finals run um, kind of took them to another level. Like, there's no other more criticism they're going to take that's going to be worse, than, especially with Tatum than after the criticism he took after uh, his finals performance. So I think, and I think they're focused. They're focused on getting back to the finals. They're mad. They're playing angry, and I think it's a good thing. Um, you you want to play with a little chip on your shoulder. They, they want to have the Clippers beat them in L.A. They want it, they, like, you know, you got to play mad. Like, mm-hmm. this is a league, you know, like, I, I love, you know, as much as Russell Westbrook takes a bunch of criticism, like, the, like none of y'all my friends, like, I like that mentality. I think more players need to have that mentality. Yeah. You know, my friends, I'm not swapping jerseys. We're not hanging out. Like, I'm here to beat you. You realize that? Like, now, if I see you in the streets in the summertime, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. I'm not swapping jerseys. I'm not signing no. You know, the one guy went up to Tom Brady and, hey, I, I picked, intercepted the ball. Can you I sign it for me? It. Like, <laughs> like, what are we doing? You know, that's nice. It's a nice gesture. And it's Tom Brady. I get it. You know, but this is, a, this is a sort of like, it's we've become the dream team, the 92 dream team where and golden players get taking selfies with Charles Barkley. Like, yeah. what are we like? Like it's different. And I think that the one thing that those guys have, especially Jalen is that fire in that competition and play the game angry. And, and the one thing that I think is, is been important that I've seen is like that revenge factor. Like they, they beat us. They tapped us. Like, we don't like that. You know, so you get the Clippers back or, you know, next time they go to Indiana, you know, hey, they got us. Let's get them or that. They play one more time that next month in Orlando. Are they, should they be fired up for that game? Hell yeah, they should. They beat us twice at home. You know, they beat us after, you know, during the Christmas time. We are, some of our families was, was there. You know, it was embarrassing. So play with a chip on your shoulder. 
I think those guys have grown to love their love playing the league, love the life of the league and what it presents, but also playing with that still that fire that they want to be great. And you always want, you don't want guys who don't want to be great. And I think both of them in their way do. We've seen Jalen improve immensely over the last couple of years in his scoring, his ball handling. Now, obviously, he's still prone to turnovers, still can improve. And we've seen Jason score in many different ways now. There's no more all three-point Jason or I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be Kobe, Kobe Jr. and take this really difficult 18-foot fadeaway with three hands in my face to try to show I can be like Kobe. Like, we don't see that much anymore. You know, Tatum is like, I remember talking to Paul Pierce in LA about that move that Tatum made to tie the game and send in the regulation Mm -hmm. where he stepped, he took a pivot away from the basket against LeBron and still hit the fadeaway swish. And I was like, that's a Pierce movie. He's like, I was thinking the same thing. That that was, that was one of my moves, you know, and you know, Paul's, Paul's not a humble guy. No, he's not. You know, so (laughs) He was like, "Oh, you, you thought that too?" Because I was, I was thinking that was me. <laughs> and 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 um, it, it's funny, but it's sort of it's true, you know. Um, Jason is 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 worked on his game, and and now can hit the mid range jumper with no problem. You know, he's. Do I wish? I'm sure he wishes he was a better three point shooter. I think the only thing that's stopping Jason from being unstoppable is being like that 41 percent three point shooter as opposed to like 36. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. hit a couple of more threes. I mean, if, if he was like 41 or 40, I'm not talking about Steph level. He's not like 45 or anything like that. But if he was, a, if he was like 41, remember his rookie year, he was 43. Mm-hmm. Um, if he ever got to that level where his, his three ball, and, and who knows? He might be able to pick it up this season. I mean, he'd be totally unstoppable. Um, but now he is he has developed. Jalen's developed, and they still have more development to do, and I think that's an encouraging thing for the Celtics. So, Gary, let's get into it. MVP odds right now. I, I, I just detailed all of them. What in your mind needs to happen, I guess, for one guy to, to set himself apart from the rest? And, and is it Luca at the moment for you? Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. Like, I'm split between Luca and Tatum, but Luca's just putting on those incredible numbers. But the Mavericks – aren't as winning as much, you know, obviously they're still kind of in the middle of the pack of the Western conference, but just the, the, the raw numbers that he's carrying the team. And I think the one thing that might boost Luca is the fact that he is carrying the team. Mm-hmm. And um, now the question is, you know, if the Celtics, let's say finish with the best record in the league, but Jalen Brown's also an all-star and Malcolm Brogdon has a, is a turn in another good year and Marcus Smart, like you see a supporting cast there, right? Um, in Dallas, you're like Duke, Luca, and Dinwiddie, Hardaway Jr., Christian Wood. Like you don't have anything close to a bona fide all star behind him. So Luca might get credit for like carrying the, the Mavericks to, you know, 50 wins, 50 and 32. And a, and, a, and a third seed and, and, and just, you know, and some of these are video game numbers. Some of these are, are just so incredible. You know, he had 50 against the Rockets, like after having 60 against the Knicks, you know? So I think Luca's probably a leader because one, Luca's one of the more popular players in the league. Everybody loves Luca. He came out of nowhere. No one knew much about him in the draft. It was, you know, you know, Phoenix passed on him, took eight, and Sacramento took Marvin Bagley Jr., which is something that, you know, Roddy Divac basically lost his job over in Sacramento for passing on Luca. It's like you're the inter- – you're like one of the first international guys ever, Vlade, and you pass on. Like, you know, you're, the, you're one of the first unknown international players who made had one of the strong NBA career, you know, you could talk of Petrovic or uh, Salunas Marshallonis and some of those guys, but Vladi was part of that like first class to arrive in the United States that played like in the 88 Olympics. And you pass on the best international prospect, you know, I mean, him and Giannis, obviously, but one of the best international prospects of all time, maybe the best since Dirk, like, you know, yeah, he lost his job for that. So I think, 
Luca's the leader at this point. Tatum, I think, is going to keep pushing, especially if they have the number one record in the NBA. But I think the fact that Luca, it's like Luca and the Miracles, like Luca is just taking Dallas and putting it on his back and beating teams by himself. And they know that he that he's going to shoot the ball. And they still can't stop it. I think it might be Luca, as the odds say, taking the slight edge, especially after this. I mean, I'm sure he'll probably get Player of the Month in December uh, as we wrap up this month. Uh, so I'd say he leads now. But if Dallas, let's say, goes 500, even though you know, then then I think Tatum takes over. I think it all depends on how much. Does Luca's numbers result in winning? Where Tatum, people I think are going to say, well, you guys are the best team in the league, and they're, uh, you know, you made the finals last year, so this is what you should do. You guys should be the number one seed. But with Luca, them losing Jalen Brunson to free agency, not really signing anybody. I've been trading for Christian Wood, but the Matt, you know, Mark Cuban has not done him any favors in terms of getting him uh, frontline talent to work. Do you currently vote for MVP? Yes. So I, I'm curious, and, and you could tell me as a voter, you know, it's in the same way that like Shohei Otani could be MVP in the American League yeah. every single year because every single year he's going to do something that's never been done other than him, and he may even exceed his own numbers. I think people look at Nick Jokic the same way. Like what he did, obviously, carrying that team last year with all those guys hurt was insane and and that much better than what he did the year prior when he had a relatively healthy cast around him his numbers were still absurd this year of course his numbers are nuts we see him do things on a given night that have never been done by a man his size before and may never be done again you could give him mvp every single year but again he's won the last two he's third in the voting right now or third in the odds right now i should say where does like voter fatigue come in is that a real thing? Like, do you, do you sort of, no matter what he does kind of cross him off because it's, well, he's won the last two and look at what Luca and Tatum are doing. Yeah, Adam, I think, okay. If I'm not mistaken. So bird won three straight, right? 84, 86. Yep. Okay. Celtics won two championships in those two years. So they resulted in winning. I think people are, are tired of the nuggets getting smacked in the playoffs and being like, yeah, this guy is amazing. Oh, wonderful player. But what the hell, what's going on in Denver? So I think this year there's even more of fatigue, like you say. I voted for Embiid last year. I thought Embiid was just a monster. I thought he did incredible things. I thought he deserved it. I, I thought Jokic had a great year, but the Nuggets once again, you know, fell short. So I think people are like – I think that Jokic a couple of years ago was in a position where Luka is now, where Jokic put up such incredible numbers. It was kind of a one-man team, and people said, you know what, we've got to acknowledge how amazing this guy is. So he won two years ago, and then he won again last year. So I think three straight, it's like, well, where's the, where's the, where's the championship in there? Or the NBA Finals appearance, or even the Western Conference Finals appearance. Where is any of those? So but I think that just to, now just you can't to clarify too. The voting happens after the regular season, right? It, it does. But I think that if people would have looked and saw that the Nuggets would lose to the Warriors and they make the second round again, I think people, some people might have reconsidered their vote because you know, I, I think I think now people are kind of tired of Denver. Like yeah. Denver's been this quote unquote team on the rise, and they're going to take and they have it. And, you know, and, and they're having a nice year this year that the Celtics play them on, on Sunday. It'll be a very entertaining game. They, you know, Celtics, uh, Nuggets might be favored. They're going to be tough at home. All those good things. But Denver has not proven it, right? They've just not gotten it done. Michael Porter Jr.'s hurt. You know, Jamal Murray missed a year. Uh, you know, and I think I think that that considering – that people, I just think people are a little tired. Yoke can, so I think Luca's in that position a couple of years ago. Where people were like, "This is the guy now." Um, but I think Yoke is incredible. He could win it almost every year. Um, but I think when you won the last person to won it three years in a row, Larry Bird, he won two chips. Like the Celtics were the number one seed in the East all three of those years. Like they were running the East 
when that was going down. You know, um, obviously they had the big three, Mikhail, Parrish, Ainge, all those guys, Dennis Johnson, uh, and all those guys, Maxwell. But I also think we all acknowledge Bird's greatness. Like, he was doing stuff that other guys didn't do. Jokic is the same way, but I do think if you said there's becoming a fatigue of, like, that's great and all, but when you win a big game, you know, uh, win, win a game, you know, win, it, win a game on, you know, that you're supposed to. Win a game, I mean, that you're not supposed to. You know, you know beat Golden State at Golden State and whip them. You know, the things that I think people are asking what's going on, you know, like, okay, Denver, show it. Especially this year mm. when the West is just wide open. There are two, uh, before I let you go, there are two C's role players I want to talk about. And spoiler alert, neither one is Rob Williams. Uh, we'll save him for, for next week, and maybe by then he'll be part of the uh, the starting lineup again. We'll see. The, 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 I, I want to talk about, well, first, Derek White. Uh, Derek White, his uh, just, I, I thought it was interesting. I saw it on Twitter earlier. My my guy, Seth, puts out a, a lot of interesting stuff. He's in our fantasy league and uh, is on the show every once in a while. He tweeted out that, that his uh, just some net rating numbers, courtesy of cleaning the glass, that Derek White uh, on the floor with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown is is plus almost 13 uh, per 100 possessions. Whereas uh, when Derek White is off the floor, Tatum and Brown, no white, negative, negative three and a half is the net rating right there. You are someone, I want to bring this up with you in particular, because you are someone who in the off season, you know, was kind of critical of, of that Derek White trade looking back at last year and obviously the way he mm-hmm. played uh, and numbers he put up mm-hmm. and the shooting splits and all of that, the latter part of the year before he, you know, settled into his, his first full season with the team this year where the numbers have come up, he's much better, all of that. And obviously is, you know, on a night to night basis has uh, been a big part of this team's success. How are you feeling right now about Derek white and, and his role on this team, maybe as, as opposed to where you were a couple months ago? I wasn't, I'm not as uh high I'll say this, like, at the end of November I was, but he's had a really tough December. And I know he had a big game against the Clippers, and, mm-hmm. and I think he made some big plays. But the thing that I – the word I hear with Derek constantly is confidence. And I think that we assume that professional athletes, because most of them have an amazing amount of confidence, that confidence is not an issue. It sounds like it's an issue with Derek, okay? Mm-hmm. It sounds like – him coming to Boston last year and being thrown into a situation going from competing for the play-in in San Antonio to like, okay, Derek, you're our floor-stretching guy. You've got to hit open threes, and you've got to do this because we're trying to win a championship. I think might have overwhelmed him a little bit, and I think that a full training camp and all that did wonders for him. But I also see that he still misses a lot of open shots. Um, I – think he can get better i think he's been better this year don't get me wrong but if you look at his just if we want to do the splits thing adam his december numbers and you know we can look those up real fast uh they're not as he struggled this month as has a lot of the guys sam hauser has hit the skids uh you know some of the other guys have hit the skids in terms of offensively but if i look at if I look at Derek White this month. Yeah, I'm pulling him up. Although you might uh, have 23.5% from three, as opposed to 45.7 in November. Yeah. Um, 37%, uh, 4% from the field. Mm-hmm. Um, 8.2 points as opposed to 11.6. Um, he's just overall, his numbers have tailed off. He had a really good uh, 21st, 22 games. The last. 14 have not been good and that's including the the win over the Clippers okay Mm -hmm. and what what, this is what concerns me Adam if you look at his splits three point percentage in his wins 43.6 in the losses 17.6 so he's playing well he's shooting 25 percent in Celtics losses like that means that in, in games when they're down, when they need somebody, Derek is not performing well. And that's the only thing that concerns me. It's great when you are hitting shots with everybody else is. 
I think personally, I, I'd like to see Derek hit more shots when other guys aren't mm-hmm. and be more of a, I mean, 17.3% from three in Celtics losses, like 44% in wins. That's, 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 that's a dramatic, you know, obviously every player's numbers are better and wins the losses. Yeah. Okay, so you know, please do not come and go. Hey, dummy! Every <laughs> every player, uh, his numbers is very true, but not this dramatic, right? Uh, to where he is Steph Curry in Celtic wins, and he is uh, boy, he is uh, George Murison from the three <laughs> in a hell of a comp. In 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 losses, forty three point six to seventeen point six, from wins to losses. So when the team is down, uh, I'd like to see Derek carry the team a little bit more. Not carry like scoring, you know, twenty points in a quarter, but get to a place where he can knock down shots to where it's like, you know, Jason wasn't good and Jalen wasn't good. But Derek was good. Like Malcolm has done that at times, where Malcolm has had 19, 20, 19 points, 21 points, something like that. That's what I need to see personally from Derek White before I'm like sign off and go, what a great deal. Another Brad Stevens coup. I don't feel that way. And I said, it could happen, mm-hmm. very much could happen. But to me, I look at that December and he's hit a real wall. Let's see if he can get himself out of it. I'm glad you brought up Malcolm Brogdon because that's the other guy I wanted to talk about. And I want to, uh, so I, I I mentioned Seth before and I texted him right before I came on with you. And I said, uh, you know, about to do a show with Washburn, anything in particular that, you know, you're curious about. And he said, is the team worried about Malcolm Brogdon? And I said, well, in, in what respect? You know, he said, he sucks. I said, how, how do you mean? Because the shooting splits are pretty good. And this this is what he sent me. He said, uh, you know, by that you mean he's shooting good percentages, but his assist rate is down, turnover rate is way, way up, usage is down, and his defense has been bad. Also, uh, all of those are statistics, by the way. The biggest concern is the combination of the turnovers coupled with the fact that only 17% of his shots are at the rim, which is down from 30% over the past three years. So what that means to me is that while he's been decently uh, decent as a floor spacer, he has specifically not been good at the stuff that they traded him for him to be good at they need him to be a a good secondary ball handler and instead he's been a spot-up guy who turns it over when he's asked to dribble what are your thoughts on Malcolm Brogdon you know in terms of you know what we've seen and obviously hearing all of that uh I think makes some good points I think Malcolm what I've seen from Malcolm is uh better than average better than expected three-point shooter not the finisher that he's missed a lot of bunnies Mm-hmm. I don't know if that counts under the seventeen percent of like I don't know if that's shot made or shots shots attempted, um, you know where where he was making thirty percent of his makes were at the rim as opposed to seventeen. So I don't know. It's no, I, or, I think I think it's the percentage of his shots that he's taking at the rim. Okay, so I've seen him personally. He's missed a lot of bunnies this year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, and I also think he has turned the ball over a lot on his dribble. And and I don't know, I don't, I don't think they're concerned, but I think they think feel like he can get better. And if you're the Celtics, you hope he gets better. I'm not talking about he's been bad. Um, but like you said, as a secondary ball handler, uh, there's been some big threes that he's just clanked, you know. Um, you know, but there's times that he has gotten going, he has become like he has become like Vinnie Johnson, like he's just become this microwave guy. Where, you know, like, you look at the Clippers game last night, you look at Norman Powell, okay? Norman Powell scored a lot, didn't shoot well, but he scored a lot, Mm -hmm. and he was a threat. And that's kind of what I'm looking from Malcolm, where he's taking his shots, but he's hitting some key buckets. But if you look overall, I'm not saying he's shooting bad from the field, but he's not, you know, he's not nine for ten. Powell was not efficient offensively, but he was scoring. And I think that that's what um, they're getting from Brogdon as much. Probably more than they thought. Like, 
the three point shots are going down. Um, I think he's doing well now, but I, but the finishing, the dribbling, and kind of the turnovers, he's not as efficient. Like I was, like I put it like a pal as you'd like. I thought I think people believed that he was going to be this efficient kind of like calming calming guys down, running the offense. Remember, it was like, well, is he going to be in the game in the fourth quarter with six minutes left in the six six point lead? I don't think that's a like I don't think we've even considered that at this point right now. Um, so I don't think he's been bad. I don't think his defense has been great. Um, I think he's picked up some touch fouls because guys are driving past him. But I think he's been solid. I don't think they've needed him to be great. Um, I, I think that there's some improvement that can be made. Um, but I don't think it's, quote, unquote, uh, a concern where they're, where management is saying, hey, who is this guy? Like, we don't recognize a guy that, we, we thought he'd be much better. I, I don't think they're saying that either. I think that they're, I think that they're encouraged, but knowing that he can get better. Cause I'm looking at his stats. Um, honestly, 1.8 turnovers. He had two, he averages, that's his per game. Uh, it's his rate is higher because he played 33 minutes last year. And he had 2.1. He's playing 23. He had uh, he has 1.8. Mm-hmm. He's shooting 43.3 percent from three. That's uh, his best, you know, since his Milwaukee days. 86 percent from the line. Uh, his assist rates down. You you know, but he's also playing 10 fewer minutes than he did uh, when he was last year in Indiana. So yeah. could you attribute it to lack of minutes to his role? Um, all of the above, I do think, but he's shooting almost 50%, sorry, 49% from the field. He's a career 46% shooter. I mean, he is, numbers wise, he's hitting everything except his turnover rate's a little high and his assist rate's a little down. But that that's, I, I kind of think that's nitpicking. Um, but the defense thing, I think is a really valid point there. Uh, can he step up his defense? I mean, he's, you know, at, he shot 54% from three in November. Mm-hmm. You know, now he's at 34.7 in December. Everybody struggled in December. Um, but his turnovers are down in uh, in December. You know, so the, uh, his assists are up in December. So, I think let I think give him some time, and I think you know Malcolm's had some injuries. You know he, he's play, you know he's missed he's already you know he's already missed six games. Um, you know he's I don't you know given his history he's not one of those eighty two game a year guys. He's more like sixty six to seventy. Um, so I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt here and see if he can just up his game a little bit. And I think he'll be fine. I I don't look at his numbers and think alarming. I think what I've seen is the turnovers and the and some missing missing some real bunnies. Um, and and that's what I've seen. Well, you, you wouldn't know from these last couple topics. We're talking about the best team in the NBA, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, what a close to 2022. And and I don't mean this podcast. I mean the team and uh, looking ahead to, to what should be. Uh, I'm with you and everything that we talked about earlier. I, I think it's going to be a prosperous 2023. I really do believe that. Uh, Gary, you know, we'll have you on the show again in a couple months. Don't like to bug you too, too often, but always mm-hmm. uh, appreciate your generosity and coming on. And uh, we'll catch you in the fantasy streets uh, sometime soon, I'm sure. So. That was great. It's great. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Gary Washburn. I am Adam Kaufman for Evan Valenti as well, who's uh, lurking, maybe doing some production behind the scenes for this show. We thank uh, all of you for tuning in over the course of the last year. We're not going anywhere. We're back with you again next week, just like the Celtics. Talk to you again soon.